here today with Brian Moynihan, Chairman of the Board and CEO of Bank of America, to discuss how corporate America is stepping up when it matters. Now, you all know how important Bank of America is to the CDFI field. It's been a vital funder of our industry. And under the leadership of Brian Moynihan, the Bank of America has grown its CDFI portfolio to $1.6 billion, providing financing for 225 CDFIs across all 50 states. This is the largest CDFI portfolio in the country. Now, in response to the current crises of the pandemic and racial injustice, Bank of America has turned to its CDFI partners. Bank of America provided $250 million in capital to CDFIs through the Paycheck Protection Program. Then, in addition, they provided $10 million in philanthropic grants to help fund the operations of CDFIs. And then they pushed their commitment even further by making a billion dollar four year commitment of support to help local communities address racial and economic inequality. And this capital is going to focus on the areas of health, jobs and training, small business support and housing. As part of this commitment, Bank of America has made equity investments in minority depository institutions and CDFIs, including our own OFN members, Southern Bank Board and Optus Bank. So this is an important time of partnership and it seems fitting. Uh, Brian, I'm really happy to have you here today and to have a chance to learn more about you, your views on the economy, the roles of banks, fintechs, and on our CDFI industry. And I know our members are so interested in your views of how we can actually sustain more interest uh, by more corporations in our field. So thank you. I want to start with the thought about community, Brian, and um, we're a community development field, we're CDFIs, and we're unapologetically committed to making communities thrive. So I'd like to ask you a get to know question. Where do you, where do you consider home? Where's your community? Well, thank you for allowing me to share the time with you today. And it's, uh, this is a group we obviously have been supporting for many, many years, it goes back 25 plus years to where we put together a formal group to work with the CDFI institutions. But so thank you for having us and thank you for at least for serving on our uh, NCAC board and giving us your wise uh, counsel over the years. So the question is, you know, where do I call home? Where I call home yeah, is, where's is home? I live here in Boston and in Wellesley, Massachusetts. But interestingly enough though, when I think about what you do and what we do, I actually think of the 90 plus markets we serve with our market presence as our communities. And we mm -hmm. serve that in the United States, we serve them through that. And so, you know, I'm on CEO groups in various areas. Charlotte is our you know, headquarters community. I'm on the one in Rhode Island because I lived there a good chunk of my life. I, I'm the one here in Boston. I have teammates on the ones in Atlanta, or you pick your city. So the idea is when we think about how we approach communities as a company, aside from me as a yeah. person, you know, I'm with yeah. where my wife is and my my kids are all in New York, but when he used to be in, at home, that's that's my home. But, but the, right. when I think about what you do, it, it's about how we extend our reach across the country, community by community, and make them strong and successful. Yeah, makes so much sense. It's one of the things that is actually a little more treasured as we all work from home at this moment. So I am. I think I can't have you here without asking a deeper question about our challenges that we face right now and as a country, as a, as a world. And from your seat, what do you see as some of the most pressing challenges facing our economy and how they affect the banking system? Well, obviously we have a healthcare crisis that is a global healthcare crisis. As early in March, when it first started coming to the United States, you know, I always have tried to stress that this is a war against a virus and we're all on the same side. And that's kind of an interesting concept to have a world war against a common enemy, but everybody's <laughs> on the same side. So you know, we've got to solve this healthcare crisis. As we move through time, <clears throat> the economy in the United States is restored at 95% of the size it was, but it's very differentiated. In other words, there are people who are back to normal, not, not maybe normal in their day-to-day -day life in terms of going to a restaurant and sitting down or going to a movie or, or moving about freely without a mask, but normal in the day to day life in terms of working and earning. And, yeah. and then there's a group that is not, and that's both companies and individuals. Exactly. And the companies are those like 
you know, movie theaters and, and cruise ship lines and airlines and uh, restaurants. And there's the people that work in those companies. And, you know, we believe that there is needed another round of stimulus, but much more targeted, another round of PPP, another round of uh, unemployment support, target the people who are still not back to normal in this virus. And, to, and that's got to help carry them until we get to the end of the period of time when the vaccine's freely available and testing is freely available and, you know, and everything goes on. And we've won the, the world war on the healthcare crisis. And when we do that, the economy will cure itself. And the question is how long that will take is more a healthcare question than it is honestly a economic question. But our job is to keep everybody in the game, keep everybody moving forward, be human about it. And that's what I think we need to do over the next uh, couple months to keep the place, keep the United States moving forward as, a, as getting ready for when it's fully back to normal. Yeah, I love the phrase, let's be human about it and on the same side. You you framed a, a, such a clear uh, vision about our big health challenge. In so many ways, people listening to us would say that financial inequality that preceded this crisis is one of the reasons that gave birth to our movement. And this health crisis has shown a big deep light on the deep inequalities in our system. And that's true in many ways, but it's also true about especially our financial inequality. And We've been uh, a field who, in some ways, came to light on the issue of the unbanked and on the issue of what we would say one in four people that are shut out of the financial mainstream. This is true about businesses, too. And we saw this so clearly in the pandemic. You now sit as the head of one of the largest banks in the country with, as you were mentioning, in all those 90 markets. You've been called the financial artery of our country, and we've been called the financial capillaries, much smaller, trying to reach. What do you think is going to have to change if we're attacking this challenge of unbanked for the banking arteries in this country to reach more Americans? I think the, the question of the impact of this uh, healthcare crisis has been uh, differentiated and, and this group <clears throat> would know the statistics as well as anybody that we know also. Um, but we have to go back a little further, especially as we hit the racial social justice issues from the George Floyd killing and the, and the outpouring, we have to go back a little further and remember that economic mobility, Raj Chetty and John Freeman, others have studied this. And yeah. we were focused on this you know, a, a, a few years ago starting and our view is that you know we really have to fix this economic mobility because everybody should have a have a chance of the same opportunity, and if they perform the same way, should have the same outcome. It isn't guaranteeing an outcome; it's guaranteeing an opportunity. And then the second thing is, with capitalism being the best system, honestly, in the world, because you see it. The question is, we have to deal with what capitalism may leave behind in the safety net and how we make sure people can make the way in that capitalism. And so, you know, those two broad principles shape you. As you saw this crisis unfold, a healthcare crisis and an, an economic crisis, it, it, you know, it outlined and, and, and made more clear the issues that we have around those issues. And so that was the genesis of our billion dollar program, which is we can do more to help on economic mobility. Coming back more specifically to the underbanked, under, unbanked, and, and, and those definitions have technical definitions out there. But when I think about what the colleagues I work with in you know, the uh, Bank Policy Institute, which is the broad, you know, the top 30, 40 uh, banks in the country that cover a substantial market share, uh, when I think about the American Bankers Association, th there is a commitment among the banking institutions to start to continue to drive with institutions like your, yours, this group represents a partnership, and but importantly on their own with products and capabilities that allow us to give broader and broader access. And we can talk about digital in a bit as helping that out. But you know, in the end yeah. of the day, of the last, you know, just this last month, we announced a new product, which is a uh, basically a loan product that's a five dollar fee, up to five hundred dollars for emergency loans, and you pay yeah. it back over ninety days. There is no interest; it's just a five dollar fee. And so yeah. we are trying to figure out ways that people can access that quick cash. That then has a mainstream banking system for our clients who need that services doing. If you think about 
Uh, on the checking account side, we simplified it. We have a no overdraft checking. We're through nearly 3 million of those up and operating today with the, the, the that we were built for no overdraft checking far before the FDIC even came out of the product because we believed at the end of the day, the key thing was to provide a, a core checking account for a mainstream institution like ours with the access you have to do it. And if it's free, if it's $250 a month in direct deposit, which is, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, can be achieved through any, really any working arrangement. And even if you can't achieve that, it's $5 a month, which we think is a fair price. The idea is you have to price your products fairly. We have to make them more accessible. We have to now use the digital, uh, it's a smartphone technology to, to help drive that. But, but we in the mainstream banking industry continue to have to drive the, yeah. the, the reach of us out into the public and also where branch locations and other things. But, you know, it's really product design, branch location, and then, and then financial stewardship and help in, in designing the products to really be the fairest they can be for, for people to learn how to manage their money well. And then yeah. with that, there's a banking backbone that provides it. Yeah. And on the small business side, it's the same, it's the same set of facts. It's, it's basically providing products. And in the small business area, that's why we're in partnership with these institutions to just allow us to reach deeper in the communities than we could reach on our own. And that's, that's been a wonderful partnership across many years. You know, it's really good to hear you speak of product innovation, of the things that can actually deepen the reach, right built into some of the biggest banks. We've also, and you mentioned it a little bit, we've also been talking about FinTech as a proposed solution for many people who are outside of the reach. Our, our field understands this, but also has concerns about when fintech platforms are used by unscrupulous lenders. You've talked about some of the product innovation that you and your colleagues have done, but do you think that there's more solutions that fintech can provide to reach deeper into the unbanked? What's your view on this? Well, well I, I, think, I think we should get rid of the concept of fintech or not fintech because that, that <laughs> talks about different types of companies. The issue is digitization yeah. is the key. And, and what, I like it. If you and I were sitting here 10 years ago or 20 years ago, <clears throat> we couldn't do what we can do today. Not because we may, you know, in the mid nineties, in the early nineties, you could do dial up internet banking. It, it was there. And in this, when the smartphone came out in with the Apple iPhone, we were the first person that had a application could be there. It's part of the reason why we have 30, almost 40 million uh, digital customers today. The difference is the, and it's not, this is some the digital divide is something we have to make sure we deal with in communities and we're working on it in, in enablement. It came up with a work, a schooling at home and things like that. But le that issue has got to be solved for society. But the core thing is the smartphone device is in the hands of so many people now. It can be used as a method of digital interaction. And that is critical. So that's not whether it's FinTech or whether it's us or one of you know yeah. other, other mainstream banks. The answer is that digital connectivity allows you to have a much different uh, uh, rate of connection, a much different understanding, you know, with notifications and warnings and things you can help people guide themselves with our Zelle product, it, or, or excuse me, with our Erica product, people can ask questions, they can see their spend path, they can more handily yeah. balance the budget. Yeah. And so it's the ability to be always on with a customer and the client in, in a form of, but the key was, it's, all, it's not ubiquitous now, but it's out in the hands of a vast majority of the households. Yeah. That means you can move yes. faster. And it's as opposed to the bricks and mortar, which was the only way to do this before, that digital allows yeah. you to do it. That allows you to lower the yeah. cost. That allows you to, then to provide checking yeah. at a, with a lower entry point for a, you know, no fees. That allows you to do things that you couldn't do before. And I think that's what yeah. the promise of digital really is. Yeah. Is this time when we're so online right now is this changing that business at all for you? Well, it, in terms of how we work as a company, obviously, in terms of my ability to, to do 10 wonderful uh, sessions like this be, without a conflict of travel <laughs> that makes it uh, available. These are all good things. But look, we, we believe it's high touch and high tech, not only yeah. in how we work with I our like customers. We, have... We, we have 4,300 branches, half, a quarter million to half a million people come in them today. We have 18,000 ATMs, three or $400 million will go out of them today. You know, we have that talented group of teammates that works for those clients locally. You have to have that. And then on top of yeah. that, you have to have the best digital capabilities. By the way, we believe in that in the way we work too, which is we have to have, I think unless we, you know, we are a work from office company, we'll get back there when it's safe as the healthcare crisis cures. But I think the culture that we want and the spirit that we want and the learning for younger 
colleagues and stuff, I think has, you know, will not be the same if we stay in this current environment. We all miss the human interaction and the casual human yeah. interaction. And so, but, but the good news is in terms of our service of the public, we've had our frontline teammates and branches out there working every day. We never closed them down. We closed some down, but we always had 60% open. We're back up, you know, in the 75, 80% open. And, and those teammates have done a wonderful job for us. But what have they done? Help people through an economic crisis with that day-to-day -day discussion with them who can't yeah. rely on me. Yeah, no, I love it. I love the, I love the and, high touch and high tech. It's Let's turn to an critical. issue. Yeah. Let's turn to an issue that uh, was a big focus in 2019 and the early part of 2020, which is our Community Reinvestment Act. As you know, CRA was responsible for driving so much bank financing to our field. It's been known as the CDFI jet fuel. We think over 50% of the funds we have to lend have been, you know, come to us because of CRA obligation. And this was under review. OCC put out a new rule. You know, but we might have been discussing something different, you know. But I think the question that is on people's minds, you know, is will Bank of America continue to be one of the CDFI industry's strongest partners in deploying CDFI? The, CRA motivated funding to people in places, even if there are changes. Is this still an intention of yours to stay in this field? We we have we will be in this field um, because this is the way we meet our responsible growth uh, operating principles. So we we believe in responsible growth. growth. We've got to grow no excuses. It's got to do it on a customer focus basis. It's got to do it with the right risk, and it has to be sustainable. And to be sustainable, you have to do best place your team is to. Work. We have to share success with our community, and we have to drive operational excellence because that allows us to pay for us. Now, that's how we talk about our company. That sharing of success with our communities, whatever the CRA is, we will still be committed to driving community uh, capabilities because, in the end of the day, a banking system in a bank is a reflection of its communities. We were started as a you know, this doesn't make sense to a lot of people thinking about Bank of America today, but the earliest part of our bank was started in 1784 as a community bank by every community. That's the way the hundreds and hundreds and thousands of institutions that have rolled together in this mighty river called Bank of America. All those little tributaries, capillaries, as you said, you know, came <laughs> from their communities. So we absolutely believe through our market presence, through our work. And so our CDFI commitments are about helping make strong communities, reaching places we can't in partnership with the CDFI groups, sometimes specialized on the, say, woman entrepreneurs, sometimes specialized with the African-American or Latinx entrepreneurs, sometimes just a community based by the physical location. But we have an absolute commitment here. And as you know, we went from a billion and a half and we've made another 250 million additional to the billion and a half we had outstanding yeah, to help right. the CDFI right. uh, institutions through the PPP. You know that for those that, um, Qualifies deposit taking institutions. We have hundred hundred million dollars plus in deposits, in, and you also you know that we've now made investments in ten uh, MDIs, uh, and one of which is also a CDFI. And and so yeah. uh, leave aside all the alphabet soup of names. The answer is we are committed to communities and your institutions that you represent uh, in this uh, in this wonderful session are those who help us reach the community, and that's what we do. Yeah. Well, oh, this is the, that's music to my ears, to our field's ears. So let me end on how we can influence more investors to have this view or to have a view that we, the CDFI industry, uh, are the right kind of partner for investors. You know, this has been an unusual time of attention. You mentioned the PPP program. You know, people like you have mentioned us on morning news shows and to the president, and we've had uh, more exposure this time. And people are understanding uh, that, you know, we can have real impacts where it is housing and uh, small business, but we still feel like there are many investors who don't know us. We look at what was accomplished in the environmental field with impact investors. And we see that others have really seen a compelling reason to invest in our uh, sisters and brothers on the environmental side, what will it take to, this is, this is a whole session about corporate America stepping up. So you know us probably some of the best of anybody investor. What will it take to keep other investors coming to us, wealth investors, 
um, beyond this time, at, you know, into the future to really do this work? Well, let me give you a couple uh, thoughts and then also some very pragmatic what's going on out there. Um, so on the pragmatic side, non bank institutions, corporations have approached us, uh, you know, Bank of America and our colleagues saying, how do we invest in these CDFIs? Because it, to them, it's, it's, you know, it's something they've never seen before. So one of our jobs is to get them organized as a, as a group and help uh, put some money uh, in a, in a, in a, in a fund or a just standalone, but a way to help them understand who you are, what you do, how to make the investments, because Dan Latender and the team have been doing this for you know nearly you know, 25, 26 years. It's it this is not a you know this is not new to us, but they don't have that expertise. It's also exactly. to your the base of your question, it's really a little different than they've done. So that that's sort of the pragmatic thing. And and we're you know what you well, you probably don't know as a group of us have been working on trying to get the companies organized who would like to make it uh, through the business roundtable and other areas to try to figure out how to help them make those investments really as an advisor. I mean, if, you know, we all have a, all the banking system has their major investments in you. But let me, let me back up and just talk about what really is going on um, across the world and, and across America. The, the confluence of events that have occurred from the investors, um, focused on you know, companies that both deliver profits for them as investors and deliver for society. The people who give money to the investors to invest, whether it's the pension funds or the wealth management clients we have who say, I want my money invested under ESG principles to make progress for society because I believe in the genius of the end, as we call it, profits and purpose. The, um, the, the weight of the corporate uh, teammates saying to companies like us, we want you to be a great company or we won't work here. The way that the customers saying, we want you to be a great company, we won't buy your products. All that has come together to, to drive a, uh, a view of what, 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 what it means to be stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholder capitalism adds the community or society element to shareholders, customers, and employee, uh, employees, and adds uh, communities to it. So if you sort of think about that, that is a driving force, whether it's the amount of investment funds going into ESG and impact, as you said, whether it is the uh, the way com companies are being run, like the way we, we've run our company for many years. This is not as new to the banking system, quite frankly, because the history of all the things we've talked about, it is new to corporate America. And so the stakeholder principles, the business roundtable announced, the uh, International Business Council, which I lead in the, in the statement in 2017 to manage with uh, purpose and and implement the SDGs, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and then the metrics we develop to measure people so constituencies can say who's doing the job. All that is going to benefit this group because you are an avenue for people to do what they need, want to do, which is to help communities and society progress. And so when I work with CEOs in corporate America, we are working on community by community, we're trying to figure out how do we help in that community, really going back to what that community needs, which for economic mobility, it's better jobs. You know, we start at $20 an hour in our company for everybody, $40,000 plus dollars a year and full benefits. And so if we can get kids into the jobs in our company and like-minded people in, in the city of Charlotte or the city of Providence or the city of Boston or the city of Los Angeles, the city of, can do that same thing, we can drive it. So we're working with groups on that. I think in the end of the day, all that will benefit the CDFI institutions because people are looking for housing outlets, which is one of the key components to think about some of these tech companies wanting to help on the housing because of how the impact they've had on community. Think of people who want to do it just because they believe it's the right thing to do and help drive it. Think about the social justice and other uh, economic justice uh, initiatives coming out. So I think the key is to for the groups to get themselves organize as best they can to interface with institutions. The key is for people like us that have the experiences help channel the money, for lack of a better term, to the yeah. right purposes. And, and so we need to be, you know, a little bit of a, a, a broker, a marriage broker here uh, for people who, who don't know your institutions and those of us that know them well and help bring them together. But I'm telling you that the corporate world, uh, and I, I, I spent a lot of time on this with various groups, corporate world is seeing much more beyond the environment, as you said, into this broad question of community development, economic mobility, sharing success, capitalism defined in a way that it can be successful, but not, not have the side effects or uh, leave behinds or other things. Those, those are all in people's minds and they're trying to figure out how to do more to make that happen. And so I think that should do well for the CDFI community. Well, that is the right note to end this uh, fireside chat on, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for your advocacy for us. 
We called this conference Finance Justice for a reason. We are ready. We're ready to be uh, marriage brokered uh, with the right partners. So thank you. Thank you for your leadership, your team's leadership. And um, let's build a more just society together. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you uh, for the time this morning. And it all comes back to that. We leave aside where I live. What I think about in our institution is we're a product of our communities and the, and the institutions represented by the CDFIs are core to helping us help those communities make progress. That's great. Thank you.